Um, welcome everyone. My name is Judy Moskowitz. I am a professor in medical social sciences and the director of research at the Northwestern Osher Center for Integrative Health, who is co-sponsoring the seminar today with IFAM. The OSHA Research Program recently selected our 2023 pilot grant awardees, and I'm really excited to have the investigators for one of those grants here today to talk to us about investigations into music intervention approaches in neurology. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I want to make sure that um, you put any questions in the Q&A box. Don't use the chat because that's not going to be monitored for questions. So if you put your questions in Q&A, we will hopefully have time to get to those um, a few minutes at the end of the seminar today. Um, okay, so our speakers today, uh, Dr. Borna Bonak Dapur um, is an associate professor in the Ken and Ruth Davy Department of Neurology and co-director of the Northwestern Music and Medicine Program. He specializes in neurodegenerative diseases, dementia, and geriatrics, and is experienced in Alzheimer's disease, brain mapping, cerebrovascular disease, frontotemporal lobe dementia or de degeneration, and behavioral neurology, neuropsychiatry. Our second speaker, Clara Takarabe, co-directs the Northwestern Music and Medicine Program with Dr. Bonak Dapur and is part of the team which created the clinically designed impro improvisatory music, a type of social clinical music designed along neuropsychiatric frameworks of felt safety. Ms. Takarabe presently plays viola in the Chicago Symphony and is devoted to community, community health organizing. And I'll let our speakers take it away because clearly I'm not speaking well today. <laughs> so over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Dr. Muskowitz. It's, it's an honor to be here and to be awarded the OSHA uh, pilot research grant. Uh, we are going to present some of the work we've been doing during the past few years, and uh, hopefully you find it helpful. All right, so we have no uh, conflict of interest to disclose, and then the list of our um, funders are in this slide. Uh, here's um, an outline of what we we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, music and how it is processed in the brain how music can be used as a therapeutic intervention. And uh, some of the work we've done uh, since the pandemic for individuals with uh, cognitive disorders and they, the kind of intervention we kind of came up with, call, we called it clinically designed improvisatory music. How did it help with different groups of neurologic disorders in the hospital? and then how we're going to use it for Alzheimer's disease and as supported by Osher Institute for uh, individuals who care for people with Alzheimer's disease. All right, so here's music in the brain. Uh, sound processing is very unique in the brain. It's kind of different than other uh, senses, uh, senses like vision or smell, they get to the brain pretty fast. Sound gets processed a lot before it gets to the surface of the brain, to the cortex. As you see here, there are at least four stations, let's say, uh, from brainstem all the way towards the cortex, where uh, the information that is associated with sound is processed in the brain. And all these uh, stations have something to do with the sound and are important for uh, our localization of the sound, of the effect of the sound on the whole body, or some of the reflexes. For example, you know, when we hear some threatening sound, we, we can res respond to it very fast before it even gets to the higher uh, cortical areas. And then finally, uh, the signal gets to the auditory cortex. And what's interesting is the, the highway from the ear and from the brainstem locations to the cortex 
is not one way, it's both ways. So uh, what we learn and, and our thinking and, and our experiences feeds back to these lower centers. And that's how uh, what Dr. Nina Krauss calls sound brain is formed and it's different in each person. One of the major uh, effects that music has uh, on the brain is the entrainment. You can see it as early as, um, you know, uh, infants. You've seen infants who listen to the rhythm and then they start moving with it. It's a very basic response and it taps into our organs. It taps into our heart rate, it, in, into our respiration, into our, uh, what's called the autonomic nervous system, anything related to the autonomic nervous system. So that, that makes music a, 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 a very quick uh, intervention to actually have some effects on the internal organs. Everything in, in our body is, has a rhythm and music does the same. So that's why that's what makes music a, a very uh, influential intervention uh, in our lives. And then when the signal gets to the brain, uh, I mean, a lot of people talk about different aspects of music in the brain. The, the major one is emotion, of course. And as you see here, this was a study that uh, Robert Zatori at McGill did, uh, where people would bring their favorite music that would give them goosebumps. So a very strong emotional response to the music. And then they looked at the brain with functional MRI. And then they saw that there were two areas that light lights up in these cases is the nucleus accumbens and ventral striatum. So these are the deeper structures of the brain uh, that are involved in reward. So that's why music and reward are very, very closely related to each other. So this was, uh, what, you know, and since we had functional imaging, since about the mid nineties, we've been learning a lot about how uh, different aspects of cognition work, including music cognition. Uh, it gets more complicated. So on the left side here, you see the auditory cortex where, you know, the first the, the signals, the auditory, the sound signals land. And then the HG here in the middle is facial gyrus. And the signal goes to the back through what's called the planum temporale, and then also goes forward to what's called planum polari, the PP here. And as you see, like other senses, like vision, the, the information takes two uh, streams, goes through two streams. One is called what we call the ventral pathway and the dorsal pathway, or the, the lower and then the, the, the upper pathways. The, the lower pathway will go into our understanding of the emotions associated with, with, with sound or music, and also with knowing, oh, this is a, a certain melody that I heard, or, you know, so kind of naming those, the melodies and, and, and recognizing them. It also will feed into the emotions. The, the dorsal one, or the one that goes top, so you're now looking at the, the middle uh, picture here. The one, the dorsal one will tap into the upper parts of the brain into uh, the parietal lobe where we can locate where things are. So a location, you know, because each ear hears things with a little bit of delay. So that's why we can localize the sound in space. And that happens in the parietal lobe. In the parietal lobe, we also learn how to uh, produce music. So people who play an instrument, well, first sense it, then they can project it to their body and then learn how to use their body spatially and with, uh, to plan the, the muscles to play an instrument. And as you see from there, we go to the pink area, which is motor cortex. And from there, we can go to the uh, green area, which is the, where, where language production. So as you see downstream, music will tap into almost all the networks of the brain. It, it taps into the visual, visual, spatial, into motor, into language, into memory, into emotions. And this is from a paper that just came out in, in neurology. It's kind of historic because uh, neurology 
didn't have that many papers, you know, related to music processing, but this is becoming more and more mainstream. And then it shows you how, uh, when uh, sound and music are processed further, it, it taps into all these networks, auditory motor, auditory limbic, somatic, visceral motor, and uh, even balance. Because when we dance, we need to hold our balance as well, right? Okay. So um, let me take you to year 2000, when I started you know, uh, becoming interested in, the, in this area. I knew I was gonna go into neurology and I knew I loved music. So I wanted to do something with both. And uh, at that time I started working on patients with patients with stroke, who couldn't talk, but who could sing. And then at the same time, interestingly, in two, year, year 2000, this paper came out in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, which was pretty interesting uh, for a you know, high impact journal to talk about music therapy. And it talked about uh, how all these clinical trials are emerging, trying to look at the effect of music in different disciplines in medicine, not just neurology or psychiatry, but you know, surgery, uh, internal medicine, and so on. And then fast forward, we have this other paper, Music-Based Intervention for Neurological Rehabilitation. This is from 2017 in Lancet Neurology, uh, where uh, uh, Sarcomo and others looked at all the clinical trials. So this is 17 years after. And we had all these clinical trials uh, looking at the effect of music for different neurologic disorders, like stroke, rehab, Parkinson's disease, dementia, epilepsy, and others. So the field is growing and, and, and it's becoming uh, part of our mainstream research and, and clinical practice. In 2017 also, uh, Renee Fleming took over uh, as, as a consultant to the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. And that uh, created an opportunity to, for her to collaborate with Frances Collins, then head of uh, NIH, National Institutes for Health. And they created this network uh, uh, and program at NIH called Sound Health. And um, funding became available for people to apply to, to look at the neuroscience of how music is processed and how it can uh, be beneficial for health. And they've, they've held many uh, conferences and webinars. Uh, one example is here relating target engagement. So how and where should we look at the effect of music? A year after, we had our first music therapy conference at Northwestern Health uh, in Evanston, uh, but initiated with Dr. Nina Krause, who invited all the authorities from around the country and uh, who talked about different aspects of music interventions and the state of science. So we got more and more involved. So this is an example. I'm gonna show you some examples of how music has been used in some neurologic disorders and um, in, in other areas. This is uh, a work I did uh, back in probably 23, four years ago. And it's called melodic intonation therapy. I did not invent it. It was invented in Boston. Uh, and uh, I, I, I did research on it later. Um, it was created in 1973. This is called melodic intonation therapy is when people with stroke cannot talk at all. Uh, but when you ask them to sing, they can't do that. Unfortunately, I don't, don't seem to be able to uh, share my sound, but I can describe it for you. It's, this is a patient who cannot say a word. Uh, They're asking him to tell his name and he, all he says is word, word, word. But then when the therapist starts uh, singing the phrases with him, here he says, hello, hello. So he can actually say the words when they're intoned. And then when uh, the, the therapist uh, advances this gentleman in the, in the process, they sing together. Then the therapist, as you see, uh, the therapist is holding the left hand and tapping to facilitate the rhythm. And then asks the patient to repeat the phrase, by himself. So the therapist gradually phases out and then gradually 
doing many, many sessions. When I did it I, with one patient, I had to do it for 50 sessions. But that the person was able to enunciate words, this was a person who could not say a word. And it's a huge difference when they can talk, uh, at least you know, with even short phrases. So um, there's been a lot of replications of this, and then it, it, it's part of what we use for severe apraxial speech, meaning when people can't talk, or severe aphasia language impairment. Um, this is uh, another work that I, I collaborated with the Center for uh, Therapy Through the Arts in Evanston, and uh, we, uh, so ITA created this uh, intervention called Musical Bridges to Memory. As you see, uh, individuals with dementia uh, in a memory facility are sitting with their uh, care partners and they uh, listen to an ensemble playing for them. The ensemble doesn't play just any music. They, uh, we uh, had questionnaires and we knew that exactly what type of music they liked and then we, we picked the pieces that you know mostly everybody would would prefer and the participants would sing along would dance would use uh, instruments percussion instruments to uh, to join the musicians and these were people who couldn't do much in in, in the facility they might have just sit there and do nothing but the processing of music is much intact, uh, even in later stages of Alzheimer's. So that's why we can use it as a method to uh, engage uh, patients with their caregivers. And then our goal was to see if that decreases the amount of agitation and anxiety, and also would it enhance their social interaction with their partners or social engagement. We recorded people before and after, and we actually showed that it improved. So after three months of intervention, we showed that uh, the individuals were more engaged in conversations and interaction with their partners and that their level of anxiety, and especially the caregivers, was much lower afterwards. Again, I can't play you. They, um, they are playing uh, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning from Oklahoma. And as you see here, while the ensemble is performing, the music therapists are going from uh, dyad, patient and caregiver, to from dyad to dyad, they are encouraging to participate. They, if they're, they are, you know, kind of lost, they, they reorient them and uh, very interactive and then a very uh, big group of people involved in this uh, intervention. We published some preliminary data last year showing the uh, results on agitation and social engagement. And then came the pandemic. Uh, so during the pandemic, uh, many things happened. We were all locked down. The musicians were not able to, to be in concert halls. That created an opportunity though. Uh, we had a lot of patients in the hospital who were isolated from their loved ones because of the isolation and, 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 and COVID restrictions. And that isolation can come with more anxiety, depression, and uh, it, it can affect their care in the hospital. Uh, we learned from actually the conference we had earlier a uh, few, few years ago um, at Northwestern that music can be used in during catastrophes. Uh, something called psychological first aid. And we thought this is uh, a good time to do something. And then so I, I worked with Ms. Clara Takarabe, uh, who will talk to you more about it. And we uh, created this telemusic program for our patients in the neurology unit. We uh, had Again, questionnaires to know. So uh, Clara would play for each of these individuals uh, through FaceTime. And we knew what, what type of music they liked. We knew everything about the patients, you know, their, their, their neurological issues. And then for each one, it had to be individualized. And they loved it. They, uh, we had surveys that you know, showed that they were very highly recommending it to others. And we got a lot of media coverage of it. 
and we published our results uh, in 2021. Uh, what was very interesting, and then, you know, as we were trying to develop this, uh, we were trying to make, to see if, how does uh, this type of intervention, and then even, you know, does it work? You know, we didn't even know at the time that, you know, you can do this through uh, telehealth or through uh, Zoom or FaceTime. But we were able to actually see when we worked with few people, you know, we asked people to measure the blood pressures, their, their heart rate, if they had any symptoms of anxiety, like chest uh, tightness or palpitation. And we showed that uh, pre-post, there are ch changes. Blood pressure goes down, heart rate comes down, people relax, their physical symptoms may go away. And for some cases, we actually saw that the, the, these changes sustained over even hours after the intervention. One of the uh, interventions we used, a, aside from the familiar music that people were requesting was this clinically improv glitter design improvisatory music where, uh, and then uh, Clara will tell you more about the details of how it works, but uh, using improvisation and just working with the sound itself. Uh, the, the thing with improvisation is, is there is no necessarily melodic familiarity. Uh, people enjoy the sound and the effect of the sound. And that's very interesting. We uh, used that with five uh, patients who were in the epilepsy monitoring unit. And we were lucky to have, because they were, in, we were, they were already connected to EEG. We had permission to look at the EEGs. And as you see uh, here on the left side, we see before CDEM or clinical design and promptor music. And then you see an immediate response to the music in the middle two panels here. And the effect goes away, but not completely afterwards on the right side. The very right uh, picture shows you where the actual effect is focused. And it's right in the middle of the uh, brain in the front. And then that's exactly where we get, based on other studies, when we get uh, effects of meditation and uh, a transition from brain waves that are faster to slower. So, you know, we could actually show that how uh, not only through the vital signs, but also in the brain waves, how uh, there is a significant effect in the brain. And then now I, I let Ms. Tracker to tell you about the clinically designed improv through music. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm deeply honored to be part of um, today's talk. Um, so clinically designed improvisatory music, which I call CDIM for short because it's such a long name. Um, we designed this um, during the telemusic uh, pilot. And we did a lot of research uh, through the music therapy literature, as well as the clinical music practice literature, also communication theory, to see um, what can make an individual feel safe. And that was our research question. Could we develop a type of music that would evoke a physical sense of safety? So from what we found were um, in the literature, was that a very limited pitch range, um, one octave above middle C, one octave below, um, using very slow tempos, um, very, very simple, uncomplicated rhythm, but also not predictable rhythms. And, um, oh, what's not on, this is sliding, a kind of prosody. Um, for example, if I said, hi, Mary, and I'm monotone, that indicates a type of danger to the brainstem. So instead I would use a kind of sliding of pitch, hi Mary, which we feel more comfortable with. Um, two very distinct features of clinically designed improvisatory music is that there's a, a slow, very slow decrease in volume to silence, very slow, and then at the end of this diminuendo is about 10 seconds of silence. Um, 
through our testing, we found that about 20, 30 minutes is the effective dosage of sedum music. And we ended up using sedum in three settings um, for the neurology department. Um, we also designed a physician recuperation room during the Scholars of Wellness program. And now it's used for psychiatric social workers who um, support families in Chicago affected by gun violence. Um, the next slide, please. So I'm going to play three statements of CDM music, and I can't see the participants here, but if you would get as comfortable as possible, if that means uh, laying down or getting to um, a sofa or a very comfy chair, please make yourself as comfortable as possible and take a deep breath. And I will demonstrate three statements for you.
Thank you so much. Beautiful. So uh, when we saw the good response from our patients in the hospital, and then uh, as you heard, we tried this method with uh, our health providers in the hospital and at NM and also outside Northwestern. And we thought, oh, so how about trying this for people with Alzheimer's disease who have anxiety? And about 40% of Alzheimer's patients do have anxiety because of this, because of the disease and then because of the response to the changes uh, in, in cognition. Uh, what if we use that rather than familiar music? Because this gives us more flexibility. Um, playing uh, familiar music requires a lot of practice from the, on the musician side and it it's, uh, could be rigid at some point. Uh, this gives the music practitioner or music therapist more flexibility in terms of interacting with the patient and it could be incorporated into music interventions for Alzheimer's. Just a, a little bit of introduction for people who may not know as much about Alzheimer's. As you may know, Alzheimer's disease is caused by accumulation of what's called the plaques and tangles. Plaques are made from abnormal amyloid protein in the brain and tangles are abnormal uh, tau protein, a protein called tau that gets accumulated in the brain cells and it chokes up the brain cells from inside. So these are dead cells in, in the brain as you see here. And what happens is uh, you see the healthy brain in the middle on the left side, and then the brain start, the brain cells start getting injured and you have cell loss and shrinking in the brain. This can happen with aging. So almost all of us are at uh, risk for this as we get older. There are some genetic factors that contribute to this, and then there are some compensatory mechanisms we all use to get around that, those changes. Education could be, for example, one of them. People who have more education, they do better. They have more what we call cognitive. But as you see uh, in, in, in this other panel, the uh, plaques and tangles start accumulating in the brain, causing shrinking or atrophy in the memory areas of the brain, and then with mild to moderate and then severe stages of the disease, you have uh, these changes in, in the whole brain. However, you can see even in the severe cases, there are areas of the brain that are not affected by the pathology. And one of the areas that's not affected is the area that's uh, related to processing of familiar music and then processing of music. And most of the sensory areas of the brain are actually not hit by Alzheimer's. So that creates an opportunity to intervene and to use those areas to help with the functions that are affected. Um, but the uh, changes in the brain can uh, eventually cause memory loss, loss of skills, word finding difficulty, and anxiety and agitation, as I mentioned. Treatment of Alzheimer's, you know, we have some. Uh, medications that have some modest degree of effect to slow down the progression. More research is being done and then two more medications are now in the pipeline to get full FDA approval. So we'll see about that. So it's an interesting time. However, it's, we can't just uh, treat a patient with Alzheimer's disease just with medications. There are other aspects that we can have an effect, for example, optimizing their sleep, optimizing their anxiety and depression, uh, environmental interventions, uh, doing cognitive therapy, and uh, helping the family, because this is a disease that affects not just the person with uh, Alzheimer's, but their care partners, their family members as well. So counseling and working with family is one of the major things we do. And we always want to make sure that individuals with Alzheimer's disease are stimulated. And that's why life enrichment is important. But if they're isolated, they definitely get worse faster. So um, to, to use clinically designed inflammatory music for Alzheimer's patients, we suggested that uh, we recruit 50 patients. And this is a, a, a proposal we sent to National Endowment for the Arts as part of the Sound Health. And uh, we were able to secure funding for this study and we're gonna start very soon. 
And we're gonna have two evaluations uh, for uh, two, week of, two weeks apart, where we look at uh, people's anxiety, neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms, heart rate, blood pressure, and we'll do a functional MRI to see if they are stable. And then after that is established, then we're gonna use eight sessions of uh, CDEM, four of which are in-person and four are through telehealth or through, um, uh, through Zoom. At the time we wrote the grant, we, we wanted to have flexibility just in case pandemic would get worse. We, we, we could uh, uh, group switch back and forth. But at the same time, this actually creates an, another interesting situation where we can continue the treatment even without the person coming to see the, the music practitioner in person. And after the, another four weeks, when we, we're going to do uh, the, the third evaluation to look at uh, how um, the music is affecting their symptoms and also the brain connectivity in the networks of choice. So th this is one aspect that we're going to be looking at. The other aspect is I, I, uh, we talked to you about is the care partners. Care partners uh, have uh, are affected a, a lot of by by Alzheimer's disease and their loved ones. So far, what we've done to use this method with, you know, our uh, faculty members, you know, you see our team on the left side and left top, and on the right top, you see the recuperation room where we use uh, music for our faculty members and uh, health providers. Uh, on the left lower picture, you see the restorative sessions we had for our uh, department. Uh, and on the right side, lower picture, you see uh, a session we have for our residents, which you know really like the idea. So doing the same for care partners, would it help? Our care partners, uh, um, as you see, well, uh, okay, I, I'm sorry. I think this is, I, I'll have to ask Clara to continue from here, and then we'll get to the care partners. So, um, so we have a clinical application of CDEM that we're exploring through research. However, CDEM has had an interesting life of its own in the community, which has surprised me. And also, I, I feel a lot of joy over how it is being disseminated, although its origins are, are rather sad. Um, CDEM was first experienced in the community setting, in a group setting as a response to the distress that Hyde Park residents were experiencing in response uh, to a death of a University of Chicago student. Um, community members were experiencing prolonged sleep disturbances, nightmares, grief, agitation, and anxiety. And, um, and so there was a conversation amongst community members about 10 days after the student's death, what can we do as a community. And so CEDEM became an option. And so Hyde Park Union Church opened up their um, sanctuary and people came in. Uh, many hadn't slept for a week or, or more. Uh, about 30 people laid down in the pews and experienced CEDEM. And afterwards, because the response was so overwhelming, um, the Hyde Park Kenwood Interfaith Council's Anti-Violence Task Force organized a conference and, and CEDEM was part of the conference as a way to, to possibly deal with the, the physiological symptoms of traumatic grief. And, and as a result of this conference, CEDEM is now part of social worker burnout and secondary traumatization relief for multiple social worker organizations which deal with the aftermath of homicide, such as Chicago Survivors and the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago. Um, in the next slide, um, Lauren, I could, oh, thank you. Um, these are photos from Israel's Gifts, which is a, a support group on the north side for families who have experienced um, 
gun violence and, and and homicide in their families. And I I have permission from these families um, to take the photo. And this is um, them laying down in the basement of a church, experiencing uh, sedum together. Um, this is a Pilsen um, church with community organizers and also anti-violence violence crisis responders who are exhausted um, and they're coming for burnout relief with CDEM. This is a classroom at Northwest Sides Roosevelt High School's Healing Day, which is a, a Saturday every so often where the school um, organizes multiple therapists and multiple uh, therapeutic modalities for the community to just come and try, um, whether it's um, a mental health evaluation, whether it's a peace circle, whether it's Tai Chi or sedum. Um, this is at the South Shore Cultural Center. This is um, a sedum rest ceremony for artists. Um, finally, this is the most recent sedum group sedum um, uh, session, and it was held at Wendell Phillips Academy High School in Bronzeville. And this is a wraparound program for staff, um, administration, faculty, students, um, social workers to experience sedum throughout the day. Um, so it started at the second bell period at 8.56 in the morning, and there was a sedum session at every um, bell period until the seventh period. And this pilot was founded by the, uh, funded by the MacArthur Foundation and supported by University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign's Carl Illinois College of Medicine and Dr. Ruby Menenhall's team. So uh, as, you, as you see this, this method has been really tried with, with different communities, different people with symptoms of distress and anxiety. We have data for about uh, 429 providers who took part in, in CDEM. And uh, from the data that we collected, you know, you see the likelihood to recommend is nine out of, this is based on Likert scale out of 10. Uh, 9.3, you know, positive emotional change, decreased tension, pleasurable experience. And then we asked people to evaluate their level of energy before and after, and, and we saw a significant change. So we thought this would be a good idea uh, for also our, our care partners of also moving seats, because they have a lot of amount of burden. They, uh, either the spouses, children, uh, sometimes parents can be in, uh, uh, involved with the care of persons with Alzheimer's disease. And uh, it can cause decreased productivity, uh, risk of depression, anxiety, and even cardiovascular and other health related issues. So um, we found the opportunity to apply for the, the, the OSHA uh, research mechanism to see if we can you know try to pilot this and then expand it further the uh protocol is going to be the same as in, in individuals with alzheimer uh in the other study where we, we have about 50 patients but then you know here we have an opportunity to work at work with care partners 12 care partners uh, uh, for one year and we're going to start very soon to recruit and uh, again, same thing, we're gonna look at the uh, psychiatric measures, fMRI and, and physiologic measures. And we uh, hope that uh, we can present our results about in about a year or so here. So just to summarize, uh, I talked to you about music in uh, the brain, how, auditory system uh, is not just about processing sound, but it taps into different areas of the brain involved in moving, planning, remembering, imagining, speaking, and feeling. Uh, we talked to you about the music as a therapeutic intervention in people with stroke, with dementia, with people uh, who have neurological neuropsychiatric disorders, and how we used uh, music as a psychological first aid during 
COVID-19 pandemic, which opened up another opportunity for research for anxiety in uh, people with Alzheimer's disease and their care partners. The restorative music for healthcare providers and care partners came out of all this. And um, it has promising feasibility. Uh, it needs more research for us to kind of get into the neuroscience of it. How does it work and how, how can we make it better? And uh, please stay tuned for the results of our studies for the patients and their caregivers. I uh, have to thank uh, my lab members who were involved in these uh, studies and also you know, in the grants that we are writing and through the analysis of the data. Uh, Jordan is our uh, biomedical engineer and Daniel, Kate and Grace are neuroscience students. And we, all, all this would not have been uh, possible without the support of our department, our chairman, Dr. Dimitri Krantz, our center director, Dr. Mizoram, Dr. Weintraub, Dr. Vassar, our, our research staff. Uh, I wanted to definitely thank Dr. Moskowitz, uh, Vanessa and Adela for uh, working with us and uh, the OSHER grant. Uh, we are, we have Todd Parrish from Center for Translational Imaging uh, and with, with whom we are working for the fMRI and uh, also thanking our uh, funders and NEA and, and uh, the OSHA pilot grant. Thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we are here to answer them. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, I had seen some of this work in the pilot application, but it's really exciting to actually hear it as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A um, and a little bit of time to get to them. So if um, anyone in the audience has additional questions, please type them into the Q&A section and we will try to get to them. Um, so just start at the top. Um, First question, and does the brain respond similarly to listening to bird song? Different sounds, water creates outside as it moves, wind going through the trees. So sounds maybe similar to music, but not. Yes, yes, uh, I think exactly that's, that's the a same. very good question. It, it, um, you know, a lot of meditative music actually uh, imitates nature sounds. For example, the uh, continuous sound of of water, a river, or you know, the continuous sound that we hear from rain. These are uh, not only inspirations for musicians, but they, they themselves can help with the meditative uh, procedures. For example, you know, people may just listen to, and then there are a lot of you know, apps and uh, interventions, as you know, that, that use those songs as well, uh, or those sounds. Um, the bird, song or uh, sounds it themselves, it's a huge area of uh, inspiration and work. And there was actually a research that showed just watching birds and listening to them in your background, that's therapeutic. So that is definitely uh, an area that can be considered for uh, meditation or decreased anxiety. Thank you. Uh, another question we have, and this one specifies for Clara, please. Are there any rules about intervals, for instance, no chromatics, nothing larger than an octave, et cetera? Do you stay within a key or mode? Oh, hi, thank you for the question. Um, so with the intervals, it, um, I do include intervals larger than an octave. Um, I'm not sure if I played a 10th. Did I play a 10th in the three statements? Um, I may have, I may not have. Um, it is not um, unusual to have a 10th or a 13th. Um, I use seconds, um, usually major seconds, thirds, uh, major and minor, um, fourths, fifths, sixths, even sevenths, um, octaves, uh, tenths, and thirteenths. 
Um, in terms of modes, um, I think that was one of the questions. Um, mm -hmm. So what happens is the, the dosage is about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes. And in the beginning, I start in one key. And, and we, we are going to write a position paper on this. So um, uh, that is in the future. Um, we start in one key and it meanders kind of in one key. And then after one break, I change to usually E flat. And that could be E flat minor, E flat major. But there tends to be a minor uh, section in the 20 minutes. And um, I do end up in the major key at the very end. Um, so in the change of key, it can also be a change into a mode. And um, of course we're using Ionian and Dorian because it's major and minor. Um, but Lydian, Phrygian, I think I find Lydian dreamy. And so I do use Lydian. Phrygian is a little, a little dissonant. Um, so I may use that sparingly or just for a little bit. Um, Aeolian for sure, because there's something about the melancholy that I find very calming. Um, and I think there's a uh, Locrian, which is fairly unstable. So I don't use that mode. Um, did I ask, answer the question? Great. Yes, and I, I want to ask a follow up that combines a couple of the questions that are, are in the Q&A. Um, is there sheet music for CDIM? Is it always a single instrument? And is it, uh, can it be, uh, is it always stringed instruments? Um, so far, our research is on the viola. Um, we would love to extend our research to know what other instruments have similar effects uh, of, of calming the brain or reducing anxiety or agitation. We don't know yet. There's just a whole world of research we need to do. Um, part of the CDEM is having double stops and intervals. So I think in some way that would rule out uh, a clarinet or oboe, but I, I'm, I don't have any certainty about that because it could be that sedum is effective without the double stops or intervals. Um, sedum is also entirely improvisatory. Um, this is part of clinical music practice, which also um, um, evaluates the listener. If there's more agitation in the listener, I would improvise a little differently than if the person came in more peaceful. So that's why I think that this is a really powerful tool because of its flexible nature. And um, as the the listener um, or the participant gets more peaceful, I do change the music to be more and more sparse to kind of hold uh, a serene state. Um, I have a question on um, the study protocols. So uh, specifically for the um, folks exposed to violence, is there, is it generally a one session, one time thing? Do people come back? Do you do repeated sessions? Is it like a group kind of process? How do you usually do it? So with Israel's Gifts and um, Institute for Nonviolence Chicago, they are um, they have just put it into their uh, social worker retreats. So it's a repeated um, session. And same with Israel's Gifts, although I've, I've met um, the organizers and the community twice, um, they've requested for kind of quarterly sessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and is it the same people who come back? I'm sort of, I'm sort of looking down the road when it's a, a prescription. Yeah, <laughs> Do you I say, okay, I want you to go to six months of CDIM, um, or is it more, it's an open session and people can come 
repeatedly or just once um, to get the benefit? Yeah, so with with Wendell Phillips Academy High School, which we had two whole day um, sessions of CEDAM, um, and the first one was May 2nd, and then the second um, piloting day was May 16th. Um, about 50 people came, and in the second session, half of them were repeats and half were new. Um, I like the idea of democratic like choice that people come to it free with their free will. Um, I also like the fact that it has an appearance of something non-clitical and that it's art based. So if there is some sort of stigma of the clinical, they won't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. I think we have maybe time for one more question. Um, why do you think unfamiliar improvisatory music generates more favorable results than familiar music? That's a question that we are usually asked. I, I don't think we claim that un, you know, uh, improvisatory music is better than familiar. It's just a different approach that I think can enrich the effect of familiar music uh, from the neuroscientific standpoint. If you wanna know the effect of music itself and only the music and sound, I would love to separate them from memory from the long-term memory. So, because the music itself has a certain very effective uh, result in, in our brain. But when you mix it with the previous memory, it, it becomes, there's, there's so much else going on. So it's, that makes the uh, understanding of how it works more difficult. So from, from our understanding of mechanistic aspect of it, uh, that's why we, we kind of wanted to look. And then nobody has really looked into this. I think eventually, if we show that, you know, if this works, we want to use both. Uh, because we do know that the familiar music, it, it does help. Um, we want to make sure that we use the right one for the person, because sometimes familiar music can bring back horrible memories. You know, there are people who come from Holocaust, right. and then, you know, some music uh, is, is very uh, disturbing to them. So in those cases, that kind of you know gives you an opportunity to be flexible. Great. All right. Well, that's our time. We have more questions, and I think we're going to try to follow up um, to make sure we get them all answered. Thank you so much for the presentation today. This has been um, a great introduction to your work, and we look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much for having us. Thank, Thank you. you so much.